Hi, everyone. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. And I'm Sylvia Earle. I'm an ocean elder, founder of Mission Blue, and a National Geographic explorer at large. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was in residence. Now they changed it the up, haven't they? <laughs> <laughs> I'm free. You're free. Um, so this is our show, Dive In where we host informal and open conversations on uh, topics of wonder and interest with the ocean community. I am going to attempt to share my screen. This is always... This is an engineering challenge. It really is. <laughs> it never... Oh no, what happened to it? Oh dear. Oh, I see the problem. Sorry. But we... We have right. the technology. Yes, it takes agility, skill, concentration, patience, patience most of all. <laughs> Mostly patience. <laughs> and before we start, we're going to remind everyone that the world is, is blue. blue. Yes, never forget that. Please don't. <laughs> it won't let us forget it. <laughs> no, never. <laughs> and we get to dive in. That's the, the next yes, we big do. step. We zero in from high above and down to the blue. That's what you're doing here. <laughs> yeah, so today we're going to be joined by John Englander. This is not John Englander. No, this <laughs> now be good. Um, he's an oceanographer and um, author, and we first met him in the Bahamas during the Hydrolab project. And he was my diving instructor. In the 19, dare I say, 70s? <laughs> oh, wow, it was. And that yeah, was you. It was me, uh, <laughs> post my, well, during my instruction. And and it was okay then to do the Mike Nelson with your uh, face mask because he was there too. He uh, right. just and came down to hydro. You were a little bit underage to be getting certified for diving, but you're, you're you know. You he flexed for us. And, and you could handle it. You know? <laughs> it was great. <laughs> So John, if you can turn on your uh, camera and microphone, and microphone. And come join us, come sure. drive in with us. It's a pleasure. It's great to be with you both. Remember so the Bahamas? The I sure do. And it, it couldn't have been that many years ago, Sylvia, but because it's- <laughs> <laughs> It just it's seems that way. Yeah. Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah, yeah I really certainly do. do. But you know, just like, well, all of us and many of our viewers too, we've been real witnesses to the changes that have happened um, really largely in you know, the last- Well, since the 1970s. Since the 1970s. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just been uh, you know, shocking to, to see the, the speed of change, um, some of the declines that we've, that we've all been witnessing. Um, and I know you've spent quite a bit of time in the Arctic and Antarctic really um, looking at the, at the impacts of the, um, you know, the melting ice there and the warming climate and came in, we've got this, this first book, your first book, I Tied on Main Street, which was um, touted as one of the most important reads of 2016. I think it's still a vital read for everybody. Yeah. Yep. But what, what, um, what got you going on this, on this trajectory and compelled you to write this first book? Yeah, thanks for asking, Liz. Um, I, back in the Hydrolab days, if you were, I was still in college, actually. I, you may remember I was coming down, I think, on working summers or something like that. Um, but I was studying geology, and I learned that during the ice ages, sea level went up and down 400 feet. Now, it wasn't going to change in my lifetime, but that image kind of planted in my brain back in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. And over the years, we all watched the oceans change and coral reefs and the fisheries and things like that that we've all been concerned about. But with the next point of my uh, my arc, as it were, is 1997, Sylvia and I were in Orlando and we uh, hosted a reception for Jacques Cousteau and uh, something for the dive industry, uh, Ocean Futures at the time. And Jacques and I got to spend a few days together. And that changed my life because he asked me to become CEO of the Cousteau Society. I realized I had to get out of the diving business. And, uh, but the couple of days talking to him about the oceans or this planet, was a pivotal experience for me that because I realized given the amazing opportunity he'd asked me to accept and how could you say no um, 
and I, he and I just started talking about what had happened in his lifetime, 70 years, he was 86 then, um, you know, working on the oceans. And it was a really magical opportunity. Then 10 years later, I was in Greenland for the first time, 2007 with Bob Carell, another uh, ocean explorer and friend of Sylvia's of mine. And um, the first night there, I suddenly, it all came together. The planet was warmer. The ice was getting smaller, the sea was getting taller, and the shoreline was going to move inland. And those four points, starting from the fact that we had warmed the oceans a degree Celsius, almost two degrees Fahrenheit, really became an alarm bell. And that night, then and there, I decided to write the first book. It took me uh -huh. several years to, to figure out how to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, so that's, how I, that's really how I got to where I am. And this is just kind of the sequel and update and expansion. So you got the message as this cartoon suggests, oh, I guess we'll have to move inland. <laughs> and, and we really have been seeing the, you know, the somewhat gradual, but certainly steady um, impacts of, of the sea level rising. And, you know, when we talk about sea level rise, most people immediately or often think about the, you know, the Maldives. Uh, this is a Mali, yeah. The capital city. The capital city, the Maldives. Uh, yeah, also of the east coast of Africa, this beautiful country made up of a lot of a string of islands. I think the highest point is just a little bit taller than you, John. That's about right. right. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've been there too. Yeah. yeah. So have I. Yeah. Beautiful and country, but vulnerable. Very vulnerable. So the Maldives and, and Kiribati are the, the, the two that we normally think about. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, just what, what's already happening there. It doesn't take a very big storm and no. storm surge to really put all of the inhabited parts of the island chain really either entirely or, or <laughs> partly underwater. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, you're seeing it in the um, particularly impacted or, you know, the, the poor communities, the underserved communities that, you know, they don't have any real infrastructure as it is. No, no mountain to climb. No mountain to climb and, mm. and really reliant on, um, you know, being able to, to farm and, and fish locally. And they're really be, being heavily impacted already. Some island countries like Palau have higher ground. And of course, Hawaii, but huh, there's no place to climb in many of the island countries. You know, the Seychelles, they have mountains. People can sort of <laughs> go to higher ground, but there's no higher ground to go to yeah. in the Maldives or Kiribati. And this is just a yeah. kind of at high tide, right? Or, or the Bahamas where we first mm -hmm. got sure. together. And you yeah. think about what even a modest rise in sea level will do or Dare I say, well, this is Kiribati, look at that. It's just barely above water now. Mm -hmm. And when a, a storm or an occasional tsunami sweeps by, yeah. you know, <laughs> everybody swims. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's just a really slow moving, um, I don't know, tragedy in, in many ways. But, yeah, no, it, it, it is. And, you know, for those of us who've, focused on the oceans and the corals and the fisheries and things like that, that, you know, Sylvia, you're the icon of, but we, Liz and I have done that as well with you. And, um, you know, for decades, um, we've, we've seen the changes, as you said in the opening, but I use sea level rise as a special uh, perspective because it's almost the opposite. It's what you're talking about now, the land will disappear and it's the flip side, if you will, of what's happened to the coral reefs and, and right. overfishing and, and pollution in the oceans um, with the theory that it's, it's where people live and they actually get more concerned if you say you're gonna use, lose valuable real estate. And, and the simplicity of it, that in a warming planet, the ice on Greenland and Antarctica will get smaller. It's pretty simple, ice melts in higher temperature. Mm -hmm. And the sea will get taller and we're going to lose valuable real estate. And I use that as kind of a back end um, or indirect way to get people's interest in, you know, in how we deal with climate change as a crisis, which is also causing the ocean acidification, right. you know, the 
change in the water chemistry and which affects the coral reefs and the seashells. So we know everything on this ocean planet is connected, of course. Absolutely. And it's a matter of how to find segments or you know uh, perspectives that that the masses can connect with. Yeah, and the changes in chemistry are a little harder for people to visualize, but sea yeah. level rise, <laughs> it's pretty graphic. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. And, and it's really at this point, it's it's not just you know these these kind of faraway places that many people are you know might not ever get to like the Maldives or Kiribati, but it's happening in you know Miami, Florida, right? <laughs> Talk about like a high priced real estate um, that's extraordinarily vulnerable, and and it's not just when a hurricane comes through or or something else, but they are having what's called um, sunny day flooding. Right. So you can can you tell us. A little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. Well, sunny day flooding is is dur during what we call king tide events, which are really perigean or spring tides, which are the maximum high tide of the year or on a 19 year cycle, as you probably know. And so, but most people don't aren't aware that beyond the daily up and down of tide, or the beach gets narrower and wider with the tides going in and out, or boats at a marina going up and down. But there's a there's a monthly cycle that follows the moon, but there's actually a 19 year cycle that follows the alignment of the planets. And so when we have king tides or just an extreme high tide, even when it's a clear sky, a blue sky like that and no bad weather in the area, the streets are flooding to an unusual height. That's a sunny day flooding event. Mm -hmm. And um, that wasn't a problem 30 or 40 years ago. But it's not just Miami, it's Seattle. They're watching for, for King Tides and they're watching for it in Boston and Martha's Vineyard and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hong Kong. And, yeah. you know, one of the things that, that people don't really think about very much when these King Tides come in and or even when you start to just get higher tides is that that seawater kind of coming up through some of the existent stormwater systems and drains and so forth. So it, it starts to corrode a lot of the the infrastructure because of the, the corrosive nature of seawater. So it, it, it creates some real problems there just in terms of trying to cope with um, keeping your infrastructure in good shape because a lot of that's got steel rebar and <laughs> you know uh, lots of, of stuff like that that will have an accelerated decay with constant exposure to seawater. Well, and also that seawater gets into the, the porous limestone in a place like the Bahamas or Florida here and uh, the saltwater intrusion actually, um, you know, taints the fresh water table. And right. like over in Grand Bahama, where we were talking about, I've kept in touch with some people there, having lived there for 25 years. And since Hurricane um, Dorian, I think it was two years ago, they're still not having their fresh water system get back to normal because mm -hmm. of the extreme high ocean levels that infiltrated into the fresh water table in the, in the island. So as who would have thought of that, you know? So. Yeah. It's even the yeah. drinking water two years later being impacted, even though the water level's gone down. It's yeah. because it's mixed in with the fresh water table. The same is true in Florida. Yeah. yeah. Florida is like the Bahamas. It's a big limestone sponge. Yeah. Well, one, one thing that's worth noting, Liz, when you talk about Miami, and um, you know, we tend to think of Miami as highly vulnerable, which it is, like Kiribati and, and uh, the Maldives, as you said. But it's, it's more pervasive than that. And I think we all have to remember that it's going to be every coastal community. For example, in your area, not only Oakland, which has a lot of low-lying waterfront, but uh, down Foster City near San Francisco Airport, that island community, and it's tens of thousands of people in Foster City, it was built two feet above sea level. They never expected sea level rise. Right. <laughs> Foster, City, Foster City will go underwater faster than Miami. Yeah. And so will Alameda, you know, we're... Right. We're, it's an island. Yeah, they're, it's an island, and, and they're not very high above sea level as it is. It's just, it's it's crazy. And, yeah. and you know, and you have that sea level um, rise combined with these powerful, more powerful storms that are coming and the king tides. And, you know, it's getting to a point now where some of the insurance companies are finally saying it's enough. You know? <laughs> Um, and they're and they're they're trying to legislate nature. <laughs> well, a lot of them are just refusing to write policies now on mm -hmm. on some of these uh, places and and on new projects. And it's isn't North Carolina trying to legislate against sea level rise? 
Well, well, they did that, but they, they did that, but they were trapped with it. It yeah. was <laughs> so embarrassed that they actually did did uh, rescind that. But yes, they did that back in 2012, I think. Right, but but it is it is really the case that uh, you know if you can't get insurance on your home anymore because it potentially either it's flooded before or it's been destroyed and and now the insurance company doesn't want to pay to have it rebuilt in the same area. You know, there's a lot of um, issues around this and what it's doing to people's oh, uh, livelihoods and property values. Consider New Orleans. In New Orleans, yeah, there's a lot of areas. You know, you see people kind of like raising their houses up, like in this picture, on stilts. To, on stilts to, to, but you can see all around, it's what used to be yeah. land is now gone. Um, and people are having to think about moving to higher ground. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you think about it, in, in our lifetimes, Below sea level was an important measurement, just as a land height above sea level was important. And there was an implication that sea level was a benchmark, right? That it was going to be the base from which you could measure the depth or the height. And we really never considered until maybe 20 years ago that sea level could change quickly enough that that benchmark was a moving baseline, which mm -hmm. actually has a wide implications for engineering and, and different datum in terms of how high should you build something. They don't even know what the reference point is to build it against. Right. And the fact that it's accelerating, it's only about a quarter of an inch a year now, but like a drip filling the bucket that accumulates and the rate's accelerating. And that's right. the problem. Right. When I first had a chance to dive in a submersible in the Bahamas, I saw old beach front old beaches that were now submerged. I mean, it really blew me away to, to be able to see that's where the coastline used to be. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I was way underwater. I mean, 30 meters underwater. And then there's another beach line below that. And, and I, but it didn't really sink in, sink in at the time. <laughs> That this could happen in my lifetime that, that i mean that it would be significant enough to measure to actually experience significant changes in a human lifetime it, it seems exactly like how i start the second chapter of the book talking about that experience in the bahamas or um, geological opener as it's funny we haven't talked about that but mm. that's the beginning of chapter two how I yeah. was 200 feet underwater yeah. and um, you know, out, saw a line of what looked like miniature beaches. And I yes. told a college professor about it. And he said, oh, that's when sea level was down that far. And take, you know, bring back some samples and things like that. But, and yeah. then, like you said, <laughs> never thought that yeah. it would change my lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. It's always been, you think about it like in geological terms, like it's going to happen 10,000 years from now or right. 100,000, a million years from now. But we but, don't worry who may worry yeah, yeah why should we really worry but now we need to worry you know we need to as your pictures show it's happening all over yeah yeah and and this poor you know this little this little house on this tiny spit i mean what <laughs> was there a neighborhood around it before you know we just we just don't know it's just um but you really feel for the you know for the people that have you know they've they've lived in these communities for you know generations and now it's literally being um it's inundated yeah, it's inundated mm. and you had the experience of going to um alaska and seeing some of the changes there as well where the, yeah, the permafrost is is coming apart at the seams from the warming the little community of shishmaref mm -hmm. it's kind of a headline story because it's an island community that's existed for a very long time in terms of the people living there but because it's in this case, it's a combination of sea level rise and also the fact that the ice that forms later and disappears sooner. So storms now come and literally have inundated the seaward side of that island and the houses are just tumbling into the sea. Yeah, no, I've been up in the North Shore of Alaska and seen the same thing. You know, be, because you're such a poet about the ocean, Sylvia, I want to uh, share a thought that, that came to me as I was finishing my book. Um, we consider the ocean our friend, of course, and we're part of this ocean planet. I, I know I speak for, for the three of us. Um, the the ocean is the wellspring of this planet's life. And the idea that it's um, that we can't live in harmony with it is just, you know, repugnant. 
and and scary, obviously, because it, it is the engine that drives this planet from protein source to oxygen supply. I don't have to tell you that any of that. But there's an interesting way to think of what's happened is that we've gotten things out of whack and we know it's we're the trigger at this point. Mm -hmm. um, the ocean is rearing itself up and the ocean, I don't want to call it an enemy, but it's it's taking land back, which may get the attention of that human species. Um, <laughs> it's an interesting poetic way to think of it, that the it's the the ocean, which was our friend and our sustenance and resource is actually clawing back our valuable real estate, our dirt. And, and maybe that will get our attention. I hope, I mean, something's got to, right? <laughs> right, it's a way it's just, to think about it. Yeah. Just, just the laws of nature are functioning yeah. and we yeah. have to respect them. And there are things that we can do to promote the edge. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> <laughs> right yeah I mean, and we see you know we see cities like i guess you know venice uh, has been a fighting sea level rise and and uh water inundation for many years and you know they do they have canal systems running through their cities they've had to build various kinds of um you know gates and uh, fortify what used to be basements and uh, you know try to try to marinize them and make them into you know watertight bulkheads and all kinds of things like this. So main streets are becoming main canal. Yeah, yeah. I love that about your your book and also the way of, of writing. It's sound scientifically straightforward. You nail the problems, but you do it in a way that people can actually relate to it, mm -hmm. and, and you take them there, and you know. It's kind of a wry sense of humor, but <laughs> it's either laugh or cry. That's right. Well, exactly. yes, of course it is. And but it's like the, the spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down, you know. Right. And and I think and I've learned a lot from you. You've been such a lyrical voice, you know, of um, a plaintive voice for the ocean, but you do it in an entertaining or engaging manner without just scaring people directly or or being dark. Yeah, and um, so in my own way, with those cartoons and things, I've, I've come to believe that if you're giving people very ominous information, you need to find a way to let them laugh for a moment because it, it really allows them to absorb it differently than right. if it's just all dead serious. Right. It needs exactly. need to in, motivate and inspire them that, you know, we've got a problem. Yeah. First of all, to know that you've got a problem. And secondly, what are we going to do about it? Right. And not be overwhelmed. I mean, you could, you could be, you could say, oh, <laughs> there's nothing there's, I can do, but, but there are things we can know. do. Yeah, there are. And that's the other great thing about your books. Oh, you okay. don't leave people just in despair. <laughs> no, you've got to see the glass half full, as I say, you know, there's a glass half empty and a half full to everything or a silver lining for some, but we'll stay with the water metaphor. And um, <laughs> it, it's, um, we have to do it. You know, it's 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 for the future and our kids and grandkids and 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 legacy. Um, as bad as things are, we've got to see a find a viewpoint of why there's hope and what we can do to uh, compensate or adapt and um, hopefully restore. And, and I, I think if we if people really feel their power, you know, that if you think about it, this before we could not know. Now we not only can know. We, the knowledge is there. Mm -hmm. Imagine if we didn't know. Imagine right. if we were blissfully going about continuing the bad behavior and not realizing it is bad behavior, and then suddenly <laughs> it's too late. It's not too late to well, no, In fact, I quote in my first book, High Tide of Main Street, I quoted you about that, Sylvie, as you may remember, actually, and it reminded me of the Carl Sagan quote in, uh, <laughs> of similar nature that, that um, as bad as things may be, what a blessing to be in a time when we can see things clearly yes, for yes. the first time. Because with our technology today, we can see things that a hundred years ago they had no inkling of. Right. Or even 50. Yeah. And you know, one of the things that you know we were really focused on, well, oftentimes in conversation, we tend to focus on the situation with where people live and their homes as, as being like the main thing that we're trying to avoid losing here. But um, we also have to think about some of these sites that are, you know, old industrial sites, 
or um, power plants and things of this nature. I and mean, I, I read in this morning's news, the story about a climate research center, which is actually falling into the sea uh, <laughs> because it's on the coast. And they quoted you as, as, and your book about, you know, what, what was going on there. Um, and then we've, we've seen the situation again in, in Florida where you are right now, um, where we've all been and spent many years. Deep roots in the Tampa Bay area. In the Tampa yeah. Bay area. Mm -hmm. But this situation at, at Piney Point where we have an old um, phosphate mine and they, they create these pools of, of toxic water as a byproduct. And these things are sitting kind of roughly at sea level and, you know, in a big storm surge or um, with sea level rise, we're again seeing deteriorating conditions. Nobody's doing anything about remediating these waters. And in this situation, uh, you know, breach of an earthen dam or a levee bank started to happen and the thing begins to leak. And yeah. it's, you know, just in the last couple of weeks, it's, you know, uh, like more than 200 million gallons of this water was Yucky shunted. Water. <laughs> it's, it's got, you know, it's radioactive, it's toxic, and it's been shunted into Tampa Bay largely to prevent homes from flooding because they were afraid that the whole the, the, the levee side or yeah, the, the, the bank was going, the bank would, would, would fail. And so it's well, just been dumped. Failing. <laughs> yeah, they are failing. So it's just been dumped into the bay, which creates, as you say, more of a of a bad relationship with the ocean because it's, you know, going to create algal blooms and dead zones and, you know, perhaps even impact the manatees and things like this. Of course. And so we really do have to kind of think about not only about where people's houses are, but what do we do about some of these sites that are in harm's way? And, uh, you know, do we start moving those, uh, you know, do we pump water out? Do we spend, uh, invest money and in technologies to remediate these sites now while we still can deal with them or, you know, what, what are these leading to? You know, at the height of the last ice age, most of Florida was totally underwater. A little bit of high ground toward the center of the state, but not right. much. A little right. island was what most, <laughs> what Florida represented. Yeah. And it was, you know, 20,000 years ago. No, actually uh, that would be a hundred, and 20,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, when sea level was down, Florida was twice the size. So it's just <laughs> right. Yeah. Got to get my ups and downs right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, so 122,000 years ago, Florida was almost underwater. And yeah. 20,000 years ago, the whole Western bank there by Tampa was, oh, yeah. was dry land. And so it was double the size. <laughs> wow. Correct. Yes. And with the locking up of water in polar regions, um, there was another hole, Florida. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But today, you know, we that really- is, That is now underwater. Yeah. And we do have to kind of think about some of these other big pieces of infrastructure that are, you know, kind of sitting now in harm's way. You know, this is the um, Laguna Verde nuclear facility down in Mexico that oh. people are- really concerned about, you know, they've been sending out uh, kind of early warnings about some of the infrastructure aging there and the potential it has in, again, it, between sea level rise, um, old infrastructure and the potential for storm surges and so forth, that this could, uh, you know, create an extremely bad situation for the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, and because everything connects, <laughs> nobody's really... But you can see it's got a little bit of elevation, Safe. you know. It's, it's got a little but, freeboard. You know, a little freeboard, but you know, you you think think about plants like this, and um, you know, in, in Fukushima, it was similarly was built very close to sea level, and a tsunami came, um, yeah. and and inundated that. So it's really thinking about looking at some of these plants and sites, and thinking about a worst case scenario and how you can. Um, get through that you know maybe you have if you had a tsunami or big storm surge here are there generators in the basement or <laughs> may they move them up <laughs> to the roof <laughs> you know no, no, it, that they it, may, it, it may be that disasters are what get people's attention by negligent suits for negligence and the cost to remediate like fukushima as you said right. um uh it, it seems that our species you know learns the painful way and and um Maybe that's what's in process now. What's it's pretty on? exciting that so much is happening so fast that in one lifetime, we can witness geologic change. Really, that's what yeah. we're doing. 
Now, when, when you think of the coral reefs that you and I saw, or the three of us saw back in 1970, I mean, it, it, it was a different reef, obviously. Absolutely. Anything yeah. you see today. Um, and the other piece of the whole puzzle that I think is worth really talking about is this issue of, of uh, subsidence. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's a big one um, that I think I hardly ever hear anybody talk about it, but uh, unless you're a geologist. <laughs> yeah, so oh, let's cover that quickly. So uh, subsidence where land goes down and compacts or when it goes up, uplifts. Um, the, the worst places like is Jakarta where they've had more than three meters or 10 feet of subsidence, therefore sea level rise as the land goes down, the sea goes up relatively speaking. So that's been the worst. New Orleans is probably the worst in the United States. Virginia Beach, Norfolk area would be the next. Um, and then place, here. Where? This, pic this picture is from Florida. Um, yeah. And the the, uh, the top of that okay. post was stuck in the ground, I think in the 19, uh, yeah, somewhere in the 1970s. And then it's gone down six feet, <laughs> roughly. Wow. There's some place near the Bay Area, Al Alviso or something like that, which is 30, gone down like 30 some odd feet. Yeah. Yeah, it's huge. So yeah. subsidence and uplift is is important and it's a geologic phenomenon. It's either natural, it can happen during an earthquake. It can also happen when we take oil or petroleum out of the ground and, and the or water. water. <laughs> right. Groundwater pumping. Yes. Uh, or and it's affected places like Tokyo. They've stopped it there by, by changing the regulations about groundwater pumping and wells. So it's absolutely true, but it confuses people because it adds to this thing about, well, if sea level is higher there and lower here and so on. But the subsidence and uplift is localized. It's in, a, it's in places like New Orleans where deltas come together or, mm -hmm. or outside of you know, the Sacramento River. Um, so it, it is important, but it's more of a confusion point because it's, it's still typically less than an inch a year. Mm -hmm. And that's in the range of what sea level is. So it either doubles or may, may negate sea level. But as sea level increases, the rate of sea level rise increases in the next 30 years by mid-century, it's going to largely overpower subsidence. It's going to be, at, because the rate of sea level rise is almost doubling every decade now. And like the pandemic, and people have learned about how exponential growth can suddenly that, change the pandemic yeah. trajectory quickly. It's the same kind of thing. You can go from, well, if subsidence is, is doing this and sea level is doing this, you know, maybe the net effect isn't too much. But as Antarctic and particularly Greenland melt faster and faster and get us back to an era where sea level could be rising inches a year, even as it did last um 11,000 years ago, sea level was rising an inch a year or more than that, 15 feet in a century by nature without human impact. So we've really got to wake up and realize that there was a natural sea level up and down. We've affected it now. It's confused by things like subsidence and uplift. Mm -hmm. um, but the bottom line is really simple. Sea level moves up and down tens or hundreds of feet we've assumed it was a level uh, line and it's not, and it's not stoppable anymore. We've warmed the planet enough that ice is gonna melt throughout this century. We should slow the rate as much as possible, but we also need to begin to deal with the kinds of situations you're, you're depicting. Um, more storms, heavier rainfall, also more droughts, changing right. weather patterns. And then we need to begin adapting like they did here in this town in a part of, uh, um, Hamburg, Germany is where this picture is from, Hoffen City. Right. Um, that, and it's a fact, I, I spent some time there. They've done some wonderful architecture to prepare for flooding. It's like for sea level rise, but they actually have a phenomenon where the North Sea bore comes up from uh, into Hamburg, which is about 60 miles inland. And it's a big shipping harbor. Hamburg's one of the big shipping ports of Europe. And so they get um, like 20 days a year when the water will come up uh, over these, these plateaus and berms here or sidewalks and uh, up to the restaurant level. Wow. So um, they've done some clever engineering to anticipate regular flooding, but it's I like it because it's an innovative way to say, how could we design cities? Right, exactly. The infrastructure could, could function for a hundred years because yeah. infrastructure and buildings should last a hundred years. Absolutely. Taking nature into account. Right. right. And, you know, and some areas we're seeing like this real 
industrious efforts to to restore mangroves and to restore wetlands, which I think can you know help in some ways because those areas are much uh, more naturally spongy. You know, they they hold hold water and and kind of ease and reduce storm surge, but um, but kind of more serious uh, um, remediation like this can really help, I think, in these areas, these coastal uh, areas that are so heavily developed along the coast. I've been hearing for years about floating cities. Yeah. It seems like <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> seems like a science fiction idea, but but there's probably some place for that kind of adaptation. It's not going to take care of the gazillions of people who are now living on in coastal regions around the world. Isn't it 50% live within 50 miles of the coast, something yeah. like that? Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, it, we will do more floating structures. That makes sense in, a, in an era of rising seas, particularly when you can't predict how quickly it will happen. So absolutely, but as you say, from the Maldives to Calcutta to Miami, you can't put 10 million people out uh, you know, on these floating cities. So oh, and you worry about what, are the, what happens during you know, a storm event, you know, do these just really try to vulnerable. rise up and down? Are they kind of, you know, yeah. you're everybody like on a houseboat. It's a, it's a little uh, tough. Yeah. No, it's clever clever. <laughs> but we've got to be practical. And yeah, as we know, the ocean is, um, can be treacherous. Yeah, it's 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 certainly not kind uh, on many occasions. And this, I thought this slide was really an important one because it kind of shows uh, the network of of you know levees throughout the United States, and levees are are used all around the world to try to manage and control water. Um, yeah, no, this is from these are all all these images are from my books. I I, yeah. I think most of these, but oh, buy the books. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is from Army Corps of Engineers. And as you say, it, it tracks the, the Mississippi River and then out to California. You know, not many people in California are aware that Sacramento, the capital, not far from you at all, a few miles, in fact, is, is actually very vulnerable because the earthen levees protect Sacramento, which is down at sea level or actually a little yeah. bit below. And uh, a break in the levee would be disastrous or the water overtopping the levee. But I think there's like 30,000 miles. I can't remember the exact figure of it, levees. It's, it's, it's an incredible number. And in fact, we looked uh, quite heavily into developing technologies for being able to uh, measure and monitor the levees and, and do more predictive failure analysis of them. Um, because sort of the flip side of that is that if one of those big levees fails in Sacramento, it also inundates the pumps that supply Southern California with the majority of their fresh water. And they estimate if, they, if those pumps get inundated, that it would probably take two or three years to get them back online. And I don't know what Southern California is going to do in the meantime. <laughs> and, and the farmland, the San yeah. Joaquin and San Fernando Valleys, if they get flooded with that salt water, yep. that's going to have an impact on the biggest agricultural uh, region of the United States. Yeah. To start growing seaweed. <laughs> but <laughs> but levees are you know another one of these adaptations that people have tried for years to you know hold hold back the waters and obviously um, throughout the New Orleans area we see a lot of them in action and and what can happen when when they uh, you know when they fail or they're overtopped and so it's yeah. not something we can we can always rely on oh we'll just build a levee we'll just do this that and the other thing we can't always out engineer nature. In the, in the Netherlands, they've been coping with this for a very long time. Yeah. And it, it really draws on human genius, but there are limits. There's some point beyond which you That's just right. have to <laughs> ignore. For a thousand years, the Dutch have been, you know, using polders and, and levees to and windmills to, to recover land from the sea. But you're right, Sylvia, having been over there a few times and talked to the engineers, they know that at the rate that sea level is rising and where it's headed during this century, that there's places the levees will no longer work, that there's there's are limitations to the height of levees, just as you said. Right. And and it, you know, it really kind of does bring up the question as to why so many cities today, at least, at least here in the in the San Francisco Bay Area, we're seeing this like this massive new developments right on the water. <laughs> why is this still happening? 
I just don't understand it. Yeah, and it's, uh, I mean, really building, you know, hundreds and hundreds of, you know, apartment units, condos, everything else, uh, just tight, tight, tight to the water's edge. And it's, um, it just seems kind of madness at this point. It's contraintuitive. Well, if you know, if you know the facts, yeah, the, the, the knowledge is there. That's the thing. It, it's baffling that it isn't taken into account yeah. when so much and, is at stake. And also, it's not just the knowledge, but you know, we, we're so emotional and we have beliefs and we want things, uh, of course, which is natural and, and human and, and part of our unique species. But there are, there are misunderstandings of facts. Uh, there are people who unfortunately don't understand quite enough about this topic, for example, who think that if we just get plastics out of the ocean that will stop sea level from rising. I mean, I, I'm sad to see somebody who tried to explain to me why they were recycling plastic and they were concerned about sea level rising. And I had to explain that those are both issues, but they were not connected. Right. Um, that we, so we do have to educate and there's enough heat in the ocean that we can't stop sea level rise this century. We can slow it and we should try, but we need to do three things, I believe. We need to slow the warming. We need to prepare for the new normal, the weather phenomenon we're seeing, the storms, rainfall, droughts, heat waves, all that. And then we need to begin adapting for the future now that we have the knowledge to realize that sea level rose early before, even without human impact, and now we're right. accelerating it. Yeah. And you know, in, in this in this slide, we you know we see Antarctica and then you know Greenland up at the top, and these are the the, the two areas with the that are holding the most ice at the moment, or has, has traditionally held the most ice, and it's where we're really seeing the this melting um, accelerating at this point. Absolutely, with consequences that are measurable. Yeah, we have yeah, the Greenland is. It, it, it's interesting to see Greenland on this map because it's so dominant. I mean, it's it is the big ice mass in the north, of course, and um, most people can't even put Greenland on a map. Yeah, it's a mile. <laughs> it's a mile of ice. But the president wanted to buy it. You know, that's <laughs> right. And it's it as as you just look at it, it's it's very close to the eastern United States in size, from nice. Maine to Florida and from the Atlantic to the Mississippi as an approximator, covered by a mile of ice still today, as North America was um, 20,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but, it, and it's melting quicker and quicker. And it's why I, I take people there each year on fact-finding trips, uh, you know, both civilians, but also military leaders, because when you realize the size of that ice sheet, it's like the first time you were in a boat and couldn't see land. The ocean seemed a lot bigger, you know, that the, right? yeah. the, the <laughs> land reference. And when I take people out on the ice sheet and put on the map where we are, and we helicopter out or we look at the glacier output and so on, and it really brings a new scale to the problem because they've thought of glaciers like in Alaska or Glacier National Park or Peru or something like that. And those are, or the Alps, and they're nice glaciers, but they're they're not even a, a order of magnitude. In fact, two orders of magnitude, a hundred times uh, smaller than than um, in Greenland. Yeah. So I had a chance in 1998 to go to the geographic North Pole, standing on solid ice. In 98. Okay. 98. It isn't solid ice anymore. No. It's not. That is such a sobering re reality. Yeah, yeah a and it's been frozen for about three million years. The fact that when people say, "Oh, well, climate's changed before," <laughs> you know, they have no sense, as Liz was saying, no sense of geologic history. That mm -hmm. um, the Arctic's been frozen for about three million years. It mm -hmm. will mostly be thawed in you know in Liz's lifetime, certainly in my daughter's lifetime. Um, that's going to change not only sea level, well, that's floating ice, actually, it doesn't affect sea level directly, which is surprising to people, but it's certainly going to change our weather patterns, because when you take that bright white reflective mass at the North Pole, as you're talking about, and turn it into dark blue ocean, which absorbs more heat, that's what's partly what's changing our weather patterns in the polar yeah. vortex and getting snow in Texas in the wintertime, you know, in, in February. That's all related to the weather pattern changing, and the biggest factors in the weather patterns changing is the warming of the ocean and the disappearance of the polar ice cap. And Antarctica. 
Tell us about that. Hmm. Sure. So uh, this is this map's a little bit colorized to show velocity, um, which is which is useful, or actually thick, thickness change in this one. Sorry. Um, I like to break Antarctica into four parts because it seemed the big white blob is hard to break down. Yeah. The, the two thirds on the right where the word Antarctica is and it says East Antarctica in smaller print, that's pretty solid ground and is about 60% of the island or continent actually more properly. Let's go to the peninsula, the appendix shaped thing that's at the 11 o'clock position, which most people see if they go on a cruise ship or some Antarctic expedition. That's melting the fastest because it's stuck out in the ocean. So it gets the ocean heat content. And it's also the farthest north or farthest from the South Pole. It's closest to South America. So that's the peninsula. Then West Antarctica, kind of the remaining bits, if you will, from the six o'clock position up to the, what, 10 o'clock position, I guess. That's actually mostly underwater. It's covered by ice right now, but the glaciers go underwater and they're getting meat melted from underneath. Yeah. So those glaciers are destabilizing fastest. And if you look off to the lower left, where it says Pine Island, Thwaites, uh, Smith, and Kohler, those are four of the, the Pine Island group. That's the one place in the world that could give us 10 feet of sea level rise. Wow. Those four glaciers, if they were to fully melt and slide into the sea, would by themselves raise global sea level um, uh, at least five feet. And, and probably more than that, in fact. Uh, so that's that's our fear and they're unstable. The one mm -hmm. other part of Antarctica besides East Antarctica, the peninsula and West Antarctica, just to give your viewers some geography or isography, I guess it would be. Geography, that's good, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, is the ice shelves. And so just above the Ross Sea on the bottom part and up in the on the top, the um, Ronnie Ice Shelf, but where it says the Weddell Sea, Mm -hmm. Those those ice shelves are floating in the water. They're almost a thousand feet thick, so they're about a hundred feet above the surface, but mostly underwater. And as they break off into new icebergs, um, our fear is that they're like stoppers in a bottle. As they get removed from those bays, that the glaciers on land can then slide into the sea, raising sea level. So that's how they impact sea level. But but technically, icebergs and ice shelves, where their weight is already supported by ocean no longer have effect on sea level because like ice cubes in a glass, and this is counterintuitive, most people assume a melting ice cube raises the level of liquid and I tell them to run the experiment at home. I have seen this, it cracks me up every time. <laughs> I've seen people in a restaurant, oh, look at the sea level rise in my glass, you know. <laughs> right. And if you, yeah, if you take, take the glass and, and if the ice is floating and mark the level, let the ice melt, the level won't change. It's counterintuitive. Right. It's because yeah. ice expands or water expands just before it freezes. So it's less dense than water, which is a very unique property of water, as you know. Um, yeah. So hopefully that helps explain Antarctica. It's over a mile thick in ice and it's greater in size than the continental United States. Yeah, it's 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 and it's, and it's it's a huge area. You know, we've built technology to get underneath the ice shelf to kind of try to see what was going on. Cause they also had this idea that there may be some volcanic activity in Antarctica. Yes. It yes. could also be sort of heating the areas underneath yes. might get like a, you know, like a we've seen some of these hot vents, right? The hot vent systems in the ocean. There's caverns now in, in Thwaites Glacier, back to that biggest one in, in the, at the uh, eight o'clock position, I guess it is. There's a cavern that's a thousand feet tall under, wow. you know, under that glacier. It's a void and there's water running through it. And, uh, and we're measuring it underneath from ROVs like your equipment. Yeah. Um, it's destabilizing in front of our eyes. Yep. And um, when people are blase or sanguine about thinking, well, sea level rise isn't gonna happen quickly, that's ground zero. That's that's the ticking time bomb, I should say. Yeah. And we really need to take it seriously because we we know where it's coming from. We know ice melts. Um, oh, there's a good. That's a good yeah. you know, cross section to show it. So there's Pine Island Glacier coming down from the continent, out over the their continental shelf, and it's that warm circumpolar water. Um, and get nice, really simple illustration. The icebergs are floating. The ice shelf is floating. It's the ice on land that is the cause or source of potential sea level rise as the ice gets into the water for the first time uh, as a new iceberg breaking off, calving off the glacier. Um, so it's a great illustration. Yeah. In your book. In your book. 
<laughs> yes. And I should give credit. This is actually from a lady, uh, Bethan Davies. She's a, a glaciologist who works in Antarctica. And uh, it's her illustration. And in the book, I properly credit her. So I don't want to miss that. It takes a team. It does. Yeah. It's a team sport. And, and we like this one as well. That we thought it was really, it really kind of helps oh. people. It's a good visualization for people to be able yeah. to understand. It's hard to believe. Uh, it is probably the best thing to put it in perspective. 22,000 years ago, at the, when the last ice age was kind of at its peak, sea level was down 390 feet, 120 meters. And here's a map of how it rose. And we have good data on this from stalactites and various uh, you know, geologic met metrics that can give us a picture of this all over the world. And what's interesting is sea level did not rise smoothly. The rate changed rather dramatically. You can see those three kind of you know bends and slope, and um, it got. And the most amazing thing is it got to the present level about six thousand years ago, which is all of recorded human history. Mm -hmm. So the reason I believe that we have trouble believing sea level rise is that it hasn't changed much in six thousand years. Of course, some people think that's the age of the Earth, but so we'll you know we'll forgive them. But um, it, for all of us who look at a planet that's four and a half billion years old and been having sea level go up and down every 100,000 years for at least two and a half million years. And you look at this last rise, how sea level rose from 400 feet, and I put it against a building there, 30 floors of a building, and if all the remaining ice melts, the water would go up the last 17 floors. Wow. It's mind boggling, even for me. Yeah. I've studied this for 50 years. Yeah, it's, it's it is. It's, just, it's really hard for people to to grip the, you know, the, the danger and, um, this is a great, you know, great illustration. So archaeologists are finding, you know, people always have loved the coasts, and in Florida, there there's evidence far offshore of where people lived. You know, geologically speaking, not that long ago. <laughs> yes, off in off on the west coast, you're right by Dunedin, where you're where you're yeah, yeah. miles miles offshore, and they tend to follow the rivers. That, that are onshore, the rivers that flowed out and, and still flow, some of them underground, and you see fresh water popping up yeah. far offshore. And, along and in fact, coast. Sylvia, an, another dear friend of ours, Phil mm -hmm. Newton, years ago told me when I was explaining some of this stuff, he said that even on um, Vancouver Island, they've seen the same thing 100 feet underwater now on mm -hmm. some of the shelves, old villages, that of course got submerged. The same as of course happened in Florida. So this isn't, you know, isolated, quirky things. This there's evidence of this all over the world that we were in California. Have. Yeah, the Channel Islands once connected or nearly connected, and now see. I mean, it's a fact. Sea level has been rising for many years, but at a level, at a rate that. We just don't notice in our everyday lives. Right. But now it's accelerating. Right. And we're the cause of the acceleration. Exactly. What it should be going be down. Actually, we should have been bending the corner and the natural curve. If you look at the ice age cycles of the last two and a half million years, hmm. we should have been entering the cooling phase with the water going down. Now it's going higher. We're in a super right. warm. And we can look in the mirror to say, oh, so that's why. Right. <laughs> it's what these primates are doing. But at the same time, you know, back to the, your point of now knowing what we what we could know, mm -hmm. knowing now what we couldn't know then, is we can, you know, we can choose not to be sort of suddenly inundated, but we can start to plan some, you know, some managed retreat and and to you know plan ahead, uh, so that we don't have a you know enormous loss of life and enormous pollution events and things of the sort that are really hard to come back from. We can mm. try to do a better job. And, and at the knowing same, is the key. Right. And at the same time, doing everything we can to reduce our, you know, our, our carbon rich habits <laughs> yeah. and, and, and really try to, to uh, do whatever we can to mitigate. Actually, this graph, which you're showing now, also from the book, comes from NOAA, a place where Sylvia used to be the chief scientist and uh, an agency <laughs> we love. Um, it's interesting, and NOAA does some great work on sea level, and uh, this graph from a report in 2017, fairly recent, Willie Sweet and uh, a, a group, um, that there's a takeaway from this that hardly anybody gets, which is it's showing 
um, five different projections of sea level rise over this century, right? From an extreme of eight feet, 8.2 feet down to uh, one foot, right? A foot and a half. Now, the same group did these projections. They don't know how high it's going to be. It's not, it's, it's like the pandemic. You, you, knowing that there can be incremental but significant change in rates can compound into exponential growth very quickly. And it, realistically, we have to allow for that, but you can't say it's going to happen for sure, just like the pandemic projections. And most people think that this is the range of sea level projections it's, or predictions. It's really just a series of projections. It could be even higher, but even mm -hmm. if you just took this as the range and said it's going to be between one and a half and eight feet, how do you design for that? Yeah. People mistakenly say, well, let's take the average. Well, I say, well, that's about as smart as planning for an average hurricane. You know, <laughs> exactly. We, we need to plan average for the worst average. case mm -hmm. and then assume that, you know, if it's not the worst case, at least we got some extra free board and some room to, to grow further. Right. We've got to start looking at these numbers differently. The span of this series of sea level projections for this century really says we can't project it, not because science is inept. We don't know how warm the planet's gonna get because we don't know whether we're gonna burn all the coal and tar sands, whether we're gonna go back to nuclear. So it's with those uncertainties, just like the pandemic, which everybody's learning from in terms of the difficulty of projections. And sea level should be thought of the same way, but it's a long-term situation. We need to design now because infrastructure lasts a century and is financed yeah. over long periods of time. And home mortgages are 30 years. We yeah, and this is, this is where this whole, this whole craziness of, of continuing to, you know, build these very low-lying homes, you know, like right in the San Francisco Bay Area. Why are you doing this? Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, what's going to happen for these, for these families that, you know, they're going to write a 30-year mortgage and, it, it, you know, it, mm. it, it just doesn't make any sense. So I look at the change in rate from the last century when it was almost flat and rising slowly. And then what's happened since we've had satellite observations right. and, and now the projections by some very sophisticated modeling. Um, based we, on evidence, not, yeah. not, it's yeah, it's not on speculation. Evidence. It's, it's, <laughs> it's real. Yeah, it's real. So it's, but, um, you know, we're getting on towards the top of the hour and I think maybe we'll move on and, and see if we've got some questions from sure. everybody. So yeah, maybe they have some solutions. Maybe they got some solutions for us. <laughs> Ideas about what do we do? How do we cope? <laughs> Read the book. And Read both books. How do we handle the questions? I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the questions and I will uh, yeah. read them and you can we'll answer them together. And sure. for everybody that's uh, viewing, you can type your questions into the Q and A box, or if you're feeling bold, you could uh, raise a hand and and Gigi will uh, call on you. <laughs> Um, let's see, Tim is asking us, could you address the ocean's ability to sequester carbon? I understand that marine plants can absorb carbon in much greater amounts than a rainforest can. Yeah, the, uh, the, you know, the ocean iron fertilization was an experiment and actually a lot of people still think there's merit to it. To the, the oceans are down in their iron content and iron is a limiting nutrient. So as an example, um, there's been some talk about whether, uh, you know, nurturing or nourishing kelp or phytoplankton, that, that might be one way to sequester some carbon in the ocean. It has a lot more potential than forests actually, but it's gotta be done carefully. And Sylvia would know more biologically about you know, the risk of that, but the opportunity to sequester carbon from carbon dioxide in effect, which would be a greenhouse gas, certainly has potential, I think, um, yeah. but and risks. Especially since it through the food chain goes to the small creatures, goes to the larger creatures, even to the whales. And in the absence of humans, much of the life in the ocean would ultimately be sequestered in the deep sea, um, the carbon contained in life. Now we take, we extract millions of tons, we call it fish. Um, seafood. Seafood. <laughs> breaking the links because all forms of life from tiny little zooplankton to giant whales, they put nutrients back mm -hmm. called whale poop to use a scientific term. That's right. 
and it fertilizes the phytoplankton. I am not a fan of the artificial iron fertilization because it's disruptive with consequences that really are, you're, you're taking a natural situation and unnaturally skewing it. Yeah. it. It's good for some, but really bad news for a lot of other things. Yep. We really need to let the natural systems function. And you think of the many ways that we are upending the, the cycles of life in the ocean. Ocean acidification is one. Huge. You change the chemistry, you change everything. Remove the natural corridors of life and the nutrient cycles, the, the nitrates, the phosphates that are naturally there in just the right form and just mm -hmm. the right amount, developed over hundreds of millions of years. And the planet that now is more or less working in our favor, and it would seem we're doing everything in our power to disrupt the systems that are working in our favor. So carbon capture, carbon sequestration, you know, leave the fish alive, and the whales and the seals <laughs> and other things to do their thing. They're much more valuable to us swimming in the ocean than swimming on our plates with lemon slices and butter. That's right. <laughs> and of course, trees, you know, even the land-based uh, carbon sequestration trees, which are very important. And unfortunately, from the rain from the Amazon to um, well, all over the world, it's not just the, the slash and burn, but the fires now. You know, yeah. we've, we've seen terrible fires from California to Australia to yeah. uh, Siberia to carbon China. To the atmosphere as yeah. a consequence. Just as we take the wildlife out of the ocean, the carbon goes up into the atmosphere. Instead of with trees, it gets sequestered in the soil, ultimately. Yeah. And the healthy living trees, of course, capture carbon. It's the natural um, solution, if you will. Just protect the wild places wherever they are. We need them. Yeah. So. Hillary is asking, I know many municipalities are relying on adaptation measures when mitigation isn't happening fast enough. Is there anything that can be done to protect drinking water systems as mm -hmm. the Bahamas, besides drastic measures that we wish our governments and corporations would take? Well, if the water is rising, like in the Bahamas, and it's base sea level, and then during a storm, when the salt water gets in and disturbs the water table, as we were talking about earlier, um, there's not much to do to protect that that I, I've ever heard of. Um, no, we have to um, unfortunately assume that our fresh water supplies are gonna get uh, threatened and start thinking of you know other ways, whether it's desalination, which has its own problems as we know. Yeah. Um, but there are some better filtration technologies today and some better ways to um, um, uh, make water that that you know hopefully will have better less less impact less negative impact but no if the ocean and it's oceans rising as a base level and then it's when it temporarily rises on top of that from storms mm -hmm. heavy rainfall uh you know high tides all in combination some some areas are, are doing a little bit more in terms of the water storage you know like in bermuda mm -hmm. for example all the houses there are designed to actually capture and, and channel rainwater into a cistern system yep. so they can you know retain some of that rainwater and then slowly uh, release it or you know to, to minimize sort of the erosion but to also provide a, a source of fresh drinking water yeah no, that's a good great point and absolutely right um all right timothy is asking what are your expectations in regard to the administration will be doing to educate the public as to the threats of climate change and actions um, that they'll be taking to address the threat. Well, it's the early days of the administration. They're hiring some really good people, as we know. Of course, it's a very challenging topic. Um, I like to break climate change, as I, I said, I referred to a minute ago, as really three different problems. How do we make our power without making the problem worse, the greenhouse gases, particularly carbon dioxide? How do we be more resilient to the new normal of weather? which is fires and droughts and more rain and so on. That's separate than the problem of slowing the warming. And then adaptation to something like sea level rise from the Greenland and Antarctic melting um, is a third problem. So while we, and unless we communicate well, we can't solve problems. And it frustrates me a little bit when people say, well, we're gonna solve the climate problem, you know, and, they, and they're all <laughs> about electric cars. Yeah. 
and uh, solar panels and wind farms, which are great. I, I've told, told it, and it's a good idea to do that, but that's not gonna stop sea level rise. Uh, certain, and, and it has no effect locally. That's, you know, the, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a global situation. We all have to pull that down. But there was a headline on Miami that I actually cite in the book, in the new book, that I'm sure you'll chuckle at. It's, it was on the local NPR station after a conference about sea level rise. And it said, Miami developer says, to, to prepare for sea level rise, cut carbon emissions. And I call, I said, tell me how, how cutting carbon emissions on a building as a developer is gonna prepare you for sea level rise. I mean, just think it through. It's, <laughs> we're, we're at 415 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. If every developer in Miami went to zero emissions, which would be great, yeah, that's not gonna meaningfully change the level in the atmosphere. Yeah. You know, and, and slow the warming. So we've got to be we've got to be scientifically accurate right. and communicate well and mm -hmm. use the right terms. And have this co have a more cohesive approach, as you say, you know, not mm -hmm. not just sort of this, you know, patchwork. Um so Gigi, I think there's a couple of people that have their hands raised. Um if they have a concise question, we could we could squeeze, uh, it, in. squeeze it in and then we'll we'll take a few more of the uh QA box questions. Gigi's on mute. No, there it is. Oh, uh, Patricia, uh, unmute and ask your question, please. Maybe she's already gone. <laughs> no, she's still muted. She's there. She just, oh, well, maybe she's gone. Yeah, she might have gone away. All right. If try there, someone either, else. Any other? Uh, let's try Martin. Martin, uh, unmute and please ask your question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Ah, excellent. Oh, well, thanks very much for the awesome presentation. I, I did. I was very lucky to be in Antarctica as a researcher in 1991 in the Weddell Sea. So I did some studies on the Antarctic bottom water, mm. and I realized how fragile the environment is. And it would be really nice from the panel to understand what you think the time scales I learned were sort of in the thousand years in terms of changes in the ocean and what you described in terms of the Thwaites glacier potentially um, having a huge impact not only on sea level rise but I guess also changing temperature salinity and other parameters in the ocean would be great to understand what wider impact you think uh, a cataclysmic event in Antarctica could have? For example, exploration, oil exploration in the in Antarctica, I always thought would be absolutely a disaster because uh, the the biosystem is so much more fragile. Thank okay, you. so um, you know you're going back to 1991. You said that's 30 years ago. Yeah, Our yeah. knowledge of Antarctica has improved uh, dramatically, uh, but obviously. Research is all additive. We, we learn more and more. The concerns in the last decade or two from Antarctica about those uh, deep ocean currents is more ominous. Um, there's more evidence of, um, of that warmer water getting in and eating underneath the ice shelves and mm -hmm. glaciers, as you probably know. And there's been some great new research, the British Antarctic Survey and the US have a, a five-year program. I think it's in its second year. It's a $50 million research program, as I remember, to uh, get better data on the quick, on the rapidly changing situation in that part of Antarctica. Thank you. Um, so we've got we've got two more raised raised hands, and then we'll go back to the um, other questions. If you have a raised hand, uh, please keep your question concise. Victoria, please unmute and ask your question. Unmuted, yes? Yes. Hey. <laughs> no question, just absolutely um, thrilled to see Sylvia and Liz doing such a great job and to meet John Englander. Wow, what a, what a show, thank you. Oh, thank <laughs> you, great to hear from you, Victoria. <laughs> Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Any other raised hand? Christopher, please unmute and ask your question. 
Unfortunately, I'm late to the game, John. Uh, I missed the presentation. I do apologise. I've only just caught it. Um, artificial intelligence, how's that helping with your work? Well, um, you know, who knows what artificial intelligence will bring, uh, machine learning, et cetera. And, and we certainly don't want to close the door. Uh, my take is that's not going to give us the answer that, uh, at least not in the next few decades, that because of the dynamics of the ice sheets, the people I've talked to and, and uh, looked at with this, uh, in my opinion, it, it's not going to really like nail how fast sea level will rise uh, for some complex reasons. So that would be my simple answer on that, I guess. Thanks. Thank you. Enjoy the books, though. Read yes, them. read them. You must have. <laughs> <laughs> you can watch this. Well, this will be on the Ocean Elders channel, so you can watch it uh, there as well. Okay, so let's pop back to our text um, questions. George is asking us, even if the 1.5 foot king tide with a new possible cat six or seven hitting anywhere from Florida to Texas, there'll be no adaptation opportunity. Um, maybe John has an idea how we could sound the alarm to get policy changes. Hmm. Yes, John. Go, John. <laughs> I'm not too sure what the answer is. That it's funny to talk about a category six or seven uh, yeah. storm. You know, we don't even have that technically, but I know we're we're looking at sixes now. Um, uh, you know, I think it's just education to to teach people what you're doing now and giving me the opportunity and what I do in my book to help people get out of thinking. Well, we can tell the next thirty years by looking at the last thirty years. We're in a new era. Mm -hmm. And um, exactly right. we've seen ocean collapse in our lifetimes, as uh, Sylvia and Liz have said. Um, we're seeing weather change in ways we, we could not have imagined. We've seen the ice change in ways we could not imagine. So we actually have to expand our thinking and um, realize that the planet we took for granted, even 50 years ago, is not the same planet. And um, we, it's, it's sad but it is what it is. It's like getting a bad diagnosis from your doctor, you know, and life throws us curveballs, and we have to deal with what we have. And um, I, I like to, you know, try and see the, the silver lining. The worst things get, maybe we get more people's attention. And I think that's part of your message too, that the, the fact that the ocean is taking back real estate all over the world, not just Miami, not just New Orleans or Venice, in 10,000 coastal cities is the way we've got to look at this. And that's not going to stop immediately, even if we all recycle and, you know, drive electric cars or bicycle to work. So it starts with information, good science. And then we've got to communicate clearly. And then we've got to realize we're planning for life on a different planet, not Mars, as some would have us do. Uh, Elon Musk and others. <laughs> yeah. This is a different ocean planet than the one that, um, you know, Sylvia and I first met. Well, the three of us first met, you know, yeah. back uh, 50 years ago. But when I when I tell people that I come from a different planet, <laughs> <laughs> you really mean it. <laughs> <laughs> and I do say that sometimes because it's not the same. No. But John, you are answering the the question that was just posed to you by doing what you're now doing. You're communicating what you know to a broader audience through your books, through podcasts, through through being willing to come and talk with us and we'll yeah. share the view. It's, it's if you know what you know and kept it to yourself, that would be really wrong. <laughs> but what you're doing is truly admirable, the right thing to do. And I certainly encourage you to Keep at it. Can't wait well, for the next book. <laughs> you've been in it. You've been an inspiration. You personally, so um, thank you, and um, thanks both of you for what you're doing with this. And we we all stand on the shoulders of others. Other, <clears throat> excuse me, others. You know, whether it be Jacques Cousteau or whether it be Jean Michel Cousteau or different people like that, we're trying to communicate, and um, it's finding ways to do it in a semi-entertaining manner. Yeah. Um, that's important. And uh, you, you know the the lyrical way you do that, Sylvia, with a, with grace, has just uh, inspired many, many for for decades. Um, Saving the planet is a team sport. That's yes. right. So we've got, we'll take another one more question. Uh, okay. And we, and we probably have to get wrapped up. 
Um, so we're kind of getting a little past the hour. But Jenny is asking, what are some of the ideas for efficiently relocating the many, many people living on coastlines to higher ground, especially considering how it's already a wee bit crowded in so many places as it is? <laughs> well, I'm, um, I, I'm out in left field a little bit from a lot of people who think the government needs to buy people out at face value and that we, uh, we, we need to just build seawalls or truck in dirt. I, um, I don't think those are good answers even though many people do. I think one is we should allow market forces to work. I think that subsidizing US flood insurance is a policy disaster. And I talk about that in uh, chapter seven of the book about insurance. It, it, it's well-intentioned to make taxpayers happy that they can afford coastal flood insurance, but it, it, pri it reduces the cost of the risk that's associated with that. And if we would privatize flood insurance over 10 years or so, and have at least three companies who could competitively bid, we'd know the risk that was de determined by the, by the underwriters. We've, we've right. removed that. Right. So that's an example. We need price signals about the risk. And thinking that the US National Flood Insurance Program, in the, for the US at least, and thinking that FEMA will come to our rescue after a disaster, and thinking that you know if I wanna live on this shoreline, uh, North Carolina or wherever, that I should be able to, I say, well, sure, but you shouldn't count on flood insurance and you shouldn't count on the government coming in and buying you at a hundred cents on the dollar. Right. Those are inadvertently, I mean, they're well-intentioned programs to buy homeowners out at pre-storm values. But when you think about it, they're removing the risk. If somebody said to you, I can't promise you that you're gonna have flood insurance, but do you wanna build in the Florida Keys, you know, and you're 20 years old and you have a young family, you know, you wouldn't do it, right? So. I, I think that instead of thinking the government's going to protect us and the government's going to do, you know, uh, going to going to take care of the risk, we need to do the opposite. We need right. to be honest with people about the problem. We need to let markets price risk where they can, because the insurance companies will figure out what their risk is right. if they're left to it. We've destroyed that system in the United States. The insurance companies that sell flood policies make about 20% off the top with no risk. I mean, think of how stupid that is. In, in a normal insurance company, they have to figure out the, the chance of, you know, paying out on a fire insurance against the premium. Right. When, they, when State Farm and Liberty Mutual sell you, sell you flood insurance, it's just the U.S. government backing it up. They make money off the service of the policy. It's taxpayers. Yeah. Right. Right. Doing that. And I think that's, I think we've underestimated the force of the market and the intelligent person to realize that they're building in harm's way. Exactly. Yeah. The subsidies are truly reinforcing bad behavior. If you want to take the risk, it should it be a personal decision? That's right. I, I, I tell people that all the time. I say, if you're 20 years old and you've got a young family and you're going to borrow a 90% mortgage, do not build it, you know, or buy in a low lying area. If you're 80 years old and have your savings set aside and this is your vacation property, have at it, enjoy it, you know, it, it, but just don't expect me to pay when your, high, when your house gets wiped out, you know, in a hurricane or, or flooded. It'd be your choice. Yeah, and, and, but there is the whole problem of people that, you know, they've, they've got a, a piece of property that's been in their family for generations and they, they do need some help to, to relocate. And, you know, there's gotta be some kind of mechanism if this is where they've they've grown up and their father's father's been there and and they're trying to you know farm that same land or whatever it is but how do we get them to um you know to a safer place as no, well i think i think there should be safety nets and, and aid programs but you touched on something really important just to finish on liz that um you know we're attached to people we, our loved ones our our parents our grandparents our kids and so on our friends and we don't want them to disappear, of course, or die at some point, and that's natural. We're also attached to places. Psychologists talk about place attachment, and it's it it's comparable to, to people attachment, that yeah. you wanna go back to where you were born, where you grew up, your summer vacations, whatever those things are, and we don't wanna give up those places. And I talk about that briefly in the book, but that place attachment is real. So we have people in denial, just clawing on to that place, which is like the photos you showed early in this program, you know, that are going underwater and we just don't want to move. There's this place in Louisiana, Il de Jean Charles, where there's like, I don't know, a few hundred residents and about $50 million has been put aside from the federal and state government to move those people. 
a third of them don't want to move. The the the, the marshland just the marshes just keep getting up. <laughs> yeah. And nobody wants to leave because it's where their parents are buried, you know, or where they grew oh, up. Sure. That's yeah. a human instinct. We don't want to give up, but we at some point we got to wake up and realize that the speed the flooding is happening. We really have to get educated and change our mindset. So what are our key takeaways from today? Okay. One is we need to separate climate change into slow the warming by all the things that people are talking about. Get ready for the new normal, the weather we have today, which is more storms, more rain, more drought, more wildfires. That's resiliency. Mm -hmm. And then third and quite separate is adaptation for what we can see coming in the pipeline, the sea level rise particularly. And those two things are totally different, but they work together. The more you understand that the ice melting is not going to stop, you'll pay more attention to slowing the warming by a policy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the more we talk about the flooding that can happen next year, not sea level rise, the more we'll realize things are changing. But then also out on the third layer, that sea level rise is, is the third layer. So I think climate change is three issues. Sea level rise is unstoppable, unfortunately. We've warmed the planet. We've put enough heat in the ocean. You can't stop the ice melting quickly. And we should be very articulate when we explain things and not use jargon. I don't, I don't even use the word mitigation because it means two totally different things in climate. It's slowing the warming by greenhouse gas reduction and it's flood hazard mitigation. And it's not a common word for most people. Yeah, so true. I talk about slowing the warming or reducing the flooding, okay? Because plain words communicate, as we all know, and we love yeah. jargon. Noah was one of the worst. I mean, Noah had Absolutely. more, things, you know, that uh, was the National Association for the Advancement of Acronyms, I think, was some people call it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we need cl plain words and, and plain language. Oh, the last one that, that I should have said earlier, one of the biggest misunderstandings about climate it's talking about taking carbon out of the atmosphere. That's not what we're doing. It's carbon dioxide that's a clear gas made of a carbon atom and oxygen, right? CO2. That's what's warming the planet. Carbon in the atmosphere is black smoke coming out of a power plant or, an ex or a dirty exhaust. Those are two entirely different substances. Now, scientists shorthanded it and said, Let's talk about the carbon equivalent of carbon dioxide. So we can also talk about methane and nitrous oxide and things like that. But it's mm -hmm. a situation where a recent president, um, who shall not be named, you know, <laughs> when he was asked about climate change, he said he wanted clean air. And, and understandably, there's confusion because by saying we're taking carbon out of the air, we really meant clear carbon dioxide, which is perfectly invisible. <laughs> we're further confusing this thing as if we're grabbing carbon out of the air, which we dealt with in the Clean Air Act years ago and improved significantly. Yep. Now we're trying to take an invisible gas, carbon dioxide. So just one example, we all, even the scientists and those dealing with policy need to talk in language that's unambiguous and think about talking to somebody who really doesn't know and yeah. look at how it's misinterpreted. Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much. We really enjoyed the conversation today. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Oh, no, I loved it. We'll do it any time for you two. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. Don, it's been too long. Yes, yeah. dry rot setting in. <laughs> <laughs> anytime, anytime, anywhere. So thank you both for what you're doing. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of it. And thank you for uh, making people aware of the book. It only published last week. It sold 1,000 in the first week, which is apparently unheard yeah. of for, for this kind Go of Go get it. And, and then get the other one too. And don't forget this one. Yes. Yeah. If you have a choice, I'd, I'd buy the new one, frankly. The, the, the <laughs> had a lot of good stuff in it. But but if instead of asking people to read two books, please read the new one. It, it's up, updated and it goes a little bit further than the first book, but um, okay. some will read both. Thank you. Really yeah. noted. Thank you. Here we are. We and, read both. <laughs> yeah, we'll read both. But before we, before we close, I uh, just want to say thank you again to the Ocean Elders, our sponsor. And mostly to everyone out there in the community that keeps uh, coming back and joining us for these conversations. Dive in feels like home to us and I hope it feels like home to you as well. Um, water connects us all. And you make us believe that the stream of dive in um, is really coming true. And we're so grateful to all of you. We're gonna come back on Earth Day it's going to be a really busy day. <laughs> you always call it water day, but um, we're gonna call it Earth Day 
so everyone else does. And we'll be joined by our guest astronaut, uh, Caddy Coleman. So uh, thank you everyone. And remember until then, take care of the ocean. As if your life depends on it. Because it, it does. does. <laughs> <laughs> thank Thanks you, again, Bob. everyone. Thank you, John. You're welcome. See you next thank time, you. everyone. Great. Bye.